Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Soda Springs Presbyterian Church. Uh, we have, I have a quite a list of announcements, and then I'll ask for um, if there's any others from the floor. Um, so here we go. Nancy Hopkins, a former member of the congregation, passed away last Sunday in Pocatello. And there will be a graveside service this coming Tuesday, the 19th, at 11 a.m. over at Fairview. Session met last Thursday night, and we took the following actions. And I just want to report this out to you all in the spirit of transparency. And some of the actions that we took, we welcomed both Bruce and Nona into membership, and we are so grateful for their contributions, both of their contributions to the life and ministry of this congregation. You all have a chance to welcome them as members in a worship service, one or two worship services in the not too distant future. Session approved holding an ecumenical Thanksgiving service here in the sanctuary on November 24th at 6 p.m. This is going to be where we are invite all the other congregations in the county to come and help us celebrate Thanksgiving together. And there's more details to follow. Session also approved a plan for me to preach once a quarter at the Malad congregation starting on November 14th. That's part of a larger plan where three of us will go down once a month on the second Sunday, is that what I figured out? Yeah, thanks, Nona. On the second Sunday, and rotate through to help um, support the ministry of that congregation. And then on the advice from our insurance carrier, session approved a plan to increase security around the building by rekeying the building and limiting the number of people that have access. And this is an unfortunate thing that we've had to do, but this is also reflective of the days and the times that we live in. So um, that will happen soon. We're also looking at other ways to increase security around our facility for our members, for ourselves, and also for the daycare center. Are there other announcements? Peggy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I was just going to say uh, a decision was made at the PWA meeting to hold the Harvest Bazaar on November the 6th in a modified way uh, due to the pandemic. We are doing takeout only. And that uh, also means that we will not be doing the baked and candy goods, the craft area, the silent auction, or the raffle. It's, it's in an effort to keep our members and our community safe. One more here. We can do it, girls. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Marilyn? That was it. That was it? Good. I, uh, in, in my long list of announcements, I did forget to mention the two announcements that are printed, and that's um, regarding Bible study, and that's the regular Bible study is still being held 10 a.m. on Friday mornings in the pastor's study. We actually have moved it out of the fellowship hall back to the pastor's study, and Maisie's leading that. And one other thing that Session authorized was a four-week Advent Bible study starting um, November 30th on Tuesday. So it will be every Tuesday during Advent beginning at 5.30, and that will also be in the pastor's study. And that is... A, that's strictly a um, Bible study during the Advent season. So, are there other announcements that I missed? All right. Let's take a moment of silence to, to center ourselves and prepare our hearts and minds for, to worship Almighty God. Amen. We enter the house of the Lord with praise and thanksgiving. Worship the Lord our God with joy and gladness. 
Please join us in singing hymn number 322, Spirit of the Living God, as we light the candles. Please uh, join us in the call to worship. <clears throat> praise the Lord, for the God is great indeed. Let us sing praises for God's glorious works. We, we give, give glory, glory, honor, and thanksgiving to the Lord, who makes and sustains all things. Now if we'll stand and sing hymn 343, called as partners in Christ's service. Confession. Merciful and gentle God, we have wanted reward without sacrifice. We have been unwilling to serve and have not humbled ourselves in obedience. Forgive our hopeless, gracious God, correct our ignorant ways, and help us to know your glory through servanthood. Guide us to be true followers of our way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the promise of the Lord. Those who love me, I will deliver. 
When you call me, I will answer. I will rescue you from danger and show you my salvation. Believe the good news in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We come now to the prayers of the people. And at this point in time in our service together, this is a chance for us to offer our own prayer concerns, our joys, our concerns with what is going on in our individual lives. And it also is the opportunity for us to pray for the people that are on our prayer list. And as is our custom, as we go through our list, at various points, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and your response will be, hear our prayers. So, before I go through the list, are there any prayer concerns, joys, or concerns that you all may have? Marilyn. You probably already announced it, but we are joyful to have our new little grandson, Isaac Robert, and prayers that he thrives and everything goes well. I did announce it last week, and I also announced the full all four names. <laughs> so it's Isaac, Robert, Kukatska. Thank you. And we, and we are so happy for you all. Any other prayer requests? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Holy and gracious God, we are so grateful to be in your house this morning. And we enter this place with joy and thanksgiving. And maybe a little trepidation. Maybe a little sadness. And that's okay because this is a house where we are welcome no matter how we are feeling. We know that you welcome us here regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what is going on in our personal lives. And we are grateful for that, Holy One. We are grateful for the birth of new grandchildren. We are grateful for the presence of Becky at the piano. We are grateful for the presence of visitors and for folks that we may not have seen in a while. Holy One, we don't take any of this for granted. Because your blessings are what sustain us. Your grace is what sustains us. And Holy One, we offer our prayers today for the following people on our prayer list. Sue Smith, Jim and Josette Huntsinger, Carol Hegstrom, Nancy Hopkins family, and Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we pray for Steve Corder, Jennifer Benningfield, Dex Dixie Ledbetter, Dustin Holston, and we pray saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today for McKay Hansen, Joey, Joy, Kathy Hogan, and the Belize Mission, praying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also today, Holy One, for Damian Henderson, for the victims of violence and disaster, for our country and its leaders, for those fighting COVID, we pray also for the people of Afghanistan, for peace in our homes and communities, 
and the world. And together we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we also are aware that there are times when we have prayer concerns that we hold so deeply within us that we are unable to speak them aloud. And yet we know that you hear those prayers as well. So we take a moment of silence to lift those silent prayers to you. And all of these things, Holy One, we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us in a hymn of preparation, number 339, Be Thou My Vision. Please stand. First reading today comes from Psalms 104, 1 through 9. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. You are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundations, so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep, as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take to flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. Our second reading comes from Job 38, 1-7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you will declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who sketched a line upon it? 
on what were its bases sunk, or who laid the cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for peace. Our New Testament reading today comes from Mark, chapter 10, verses 33 through 45. And if you all have been following the lectionary, you'll notice that I'm adding two verses to the reading today that is normally found in the lectionary for this Sunday. See, we are going to up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whomever, whosoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. All of these readings are God's words for God's people, and we respond by saying, thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth be your words and not mine. Amen. So have you ever met someone who's so ambitious that they'll do anything to get and hold on to power, wealth, possessions, or position? I'm sure you have, and so have I. Now personally, I try to avoid these types of people because I can never trust their motives or any of the words that come out of their mouths. When a person's only goal in life is to acquire and maintain power and position over others, or to acquire wealth and possessions at the expense of others, then Houston, we have a problem. People like this will do or say anything to get what they want, and they rarely care who they have to step on to get it. So, okay, I've just described just about every single politician that's ever lived, but the the problem isn't strictly limited to the realm of politics. To one degree or another, whether it's spoken aloud or not, this ambition and vanity, this desire for position and power, this desire for wealth and possessions is something that's simply part of the human condition. And we all suffer from it. If we're truly honest with ourselves, who doesn't want to be in charge and who doesn't want lots of money and lots of things? While this is problematic in politics, I think it's even more of an issue when ambition, vanity, and the desire for power and position manifests itself in the church. 
We've all known of pastors who are more concerned with getting their faces on TV or filling their 6,000 seat buildings or buying their next Lear jet instead of being concerned with feeding the hungry, housing the homeless. And we've all known congregational leaders who are more interested in protecting their turf and preserving their power instead of being concerned with serving Christ's church. Now, whenever I read the passage from Mark that's our reading for today, I honestly don't know whether to laugh or cry. On the surface, this is just another example of the disciples, and not just James and John, being fumbling, bumbling keystone cops who just don't get it. In verses 33 and 34, um, Jesus predicts his passion on the cross for the third time, folks. And yet none of the disciples actually understand what's about to happen. Or if they do, they've become blinded by their own ambitions. Instead of hearing what Jesus has to say about his impending crucifixion, Zeb's sons, in a totally tone-deaf matter, immediately start jockeying for the best position. And to make matters worse, James and John get kind of sneaky about it. Knowing what they're about to ask isn't going to go down very well. When, in the last part of verse 35, they try and trick Jesus into promising to give them anything they want. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now Jesus, he sees right through this, and very politely asks, okay, what do you want me to do? But I can't imagine Jesus being very happy with the response. Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. And I wince every time I read that verse. And, but before I go on, let me explain how this passage, this particular reading, is portrayed in some of the other gospel accounts. Matthew appears to be somewhat squeamish about the arrogance that James and John have since he has their mother making the request, blaming the whole incident on a pushy mother. Matthew 20, verse 20. Verse 20. Luke glosses over the whole thing, calling it a, quote, dispute over which of the disciples would be the greatest. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. And the Gospel of John doesn't even mention this. We'll never know if the differences in the Gospel accounts are due to the embarrassment felt by the different writers at this brazen request. But if we haven't laughed out loud at the request, then maybe we feel a sense of embarrassment ourselves for these cherished disciples. Part of our chagrin may have something to do with the fact that in some form or another, we are all sons and daughters of Zebedee. Now, let me remind y'all, James and John weren't new followers of Jesus. They, along with Simon, Peter, and Andrew, were among the first disciples to be called by Jesus. They've been with Jesus throughout the entire three years of his ministry and were leaders among the twelve. They should have known better, and yet they too succumb to their base nature. Jesus makes it very clear just what he thinks about the whole situation, and today's reading ends with this response to James and John's ridiculous request. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Today's reading is all about rising above our human tendency to strive for power, possessions, and position. It's a call to put ourselves last, not first. And this means taking Jesus' words in verses 44 and 45 to heart, and it comes down to being a servant to others. While this speaks to all of us who are followers of the risen Christ, I believe that this is especially important for those of us who serve in leadership roles within the church. Now let me be clear, 
ambition in and of itself isn't a bad thing. Striving to become a better person through education, working to advance ourselves so we can properly support our families, or working to gain a position of authority so we can help give the least of these a leg up, these are all positive examples of how ambition can be used for good. It's only when ambition is sought after in an effort to satisfy our own selfish need to be in charge or in control where it becomes a problem. In 1970, Robert F. Greenleaf coined the phrase servant leader to describe a different type of management style that stands in direct contrast to traditional leadership models. In defining this new concept, Greenleaf writes in part that a servant leader focuses primarily on the growth and well-being of people and the communities to which they belong. While traditional leadership generally involves the accumulation and exercise of power by one at the top of the pyramid, servant leadership is different. The servant leader shares power puts the needs of others first and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. Sounds like a pretty good job description for church leaders, doesn't it? Now I don't know if Robert Greenleaf had our reading in mind when he developed the concept of servant leadership, but this definition certainly captures the intent of what Jesus is calling all of us, leaders or not, to be. For me, the idea of servant leadership resonates very strongly, and I've attempted to make that a cornerstone of my ministry. Our Presbyterian system offers the perfect opportunity to put the concept of servant leadership into practice. Ours is not a top-down system, and I don't get to sit at the top of the pyramid and tell you all how it's going to be. And believe me, I'm grateful for that. Trust me on that one. The ordination vows I took are the exact same vows that each elder, deacon, and pastor take with very minor changes in the wording to reflect the specific office to which God has called us. In a nutshell, what this means is that the session and I are called to work in a collaborative manner for the benefit of the entire congregation. One of the first things I told Session when I got here was that I would lead in the areas that I, I've been called to lead. Preaching, pastoral care, moderating the session, etc. And in turn, I would expect them to lead in the areas where God has called them to lead. Now this doesn't mean I don't have opinions. And it doesn't mean that I hold back from sharing those opinions. Just ask any of the Session members how opinionated I can really be. What this does mean, though, is that I don't impose my will on the session or on you, the congregation. In session, we discuss, we debate, and in the end, we let the Holy Spirit guide all of our actions and decisions. It's simply the Presbyterian way, and it's a great system when everyone involved is willing to be a servant leader and work for the common good. Now, this means that I'm not exempt from the various jobs that need to be done around here just because I'm the pastor. So you'll find me on clogging toilets, or setting up chairs, or opening or closing the building if that's what needs to be done. These are just a few ways that I try to practice servant leadership as your pastor. Now, there is an inherent danger in, the, in our system and it becomes apparent when congregational leaders, and not just members of session, refuse to put aside their thirst for personal power or position. A friend of mine tells the story of a Presbyterian church in upstate New York, where the church treasurer was allowed to pretty much run the show. Every decision had to be run by her, whether it involved finances or not. Everyone, including the pastor, was afraid of her, and the session did nothing to correct the situation. When the pastor finally challenged the treasurer's quest for power, she convinced the session that they could no longer afford a minister, and even though there were other options, the session terminated the pastor's contract. 
As you can imagine, the whole situation didn't end well, and after he left, Presbytery closed the church. So who do you think this woman served? Sisters and brothers, we are called by Christ himself to serve others instead of being served. We are called by Christ himself to rise above our natural tendency to strive for personal status or possessions. We are called by Christ himself to act in a countercultural way and let go of our quest for position and power at the expense of others. And I'll admit, I struggle with answering that call myself. However, as we see in today's reading, this is exactly what our Lord and Savior is calling us to do. So, I'll close by asking this question. Who or what do we serve? Whose servant are we? Do we serve our individual ambitions and vanities? Do we serve our quest for personal power or position? Are we just serving our desire to acquire money or possessions? Or are we, as all of us have been called to do, serving Jesus Christ and his church in order to strengthen and build up the kingdom of God? Amen. Would the ushers please step forward?
we are called to go out in the world and resist that natural tendency to seek position and power over other people. We are called to be a countercultural people. And that is our charge today and always. And may God watch between me and thee while we're absent, one from the other. Amen. And all God's people said, Alleluia. Amen. Amen.